Welcome to Conversations. I'm Barbara Canalopoulos. Well, we know from the number of book clubs in Falmouth that Falmouth reads, but Falmouth also writes. And today we have with us one of Falmouth's writers, Mark Patton, who has written a book entitled The Triforium. Welcome to the program, Mark. Glad to be right. here, Barbara. And congratulations on having your book published, The Triforium. Perhaps you can explain to viewers what, uh, what that word means. A triforium is a term for basically the attic area of a Gothic cathedral. It's on the second floor, just below the flying buttresses, and it has an extensive gallery that f frequently goes around the high altar. Uh, in Westminster Abbey, where this book takes place, the way you access it is through a small door in Poet's Corner, up some meandering steps, and it's used to store uh, old, old statuary that has fallen out of favor or uh, various uh, bric-a-brac -a for royal weddings and uh, other things of that nature. So. so the Triforium, then, is your setting for your novel which is, um, um, your publisher says that it, the genre, we have something to choose, satire, um, um, fantasy, um, a ghost story, humor, which one of those dominates? Uh, I think all three, but uh, it, it's a unique ghost story, and I think humorous as well. Mm -hmm. um, what separates it from most ghost stories is, I believe in most ghost stories, the ghost is an extension of the person, an embodiment of, of the person. In this case, the uh, ghosts are utilizing almost parasitically human beings. That the human being might be the placenta for the ghost, which they eventually hatch from. I see. So a bit of the paranormal then here. Yeah, a little bit right, of that. Right, that's true. But it's um, the story. Uh, the character is a modern, uh, a modern individual, mm -hmm. Wallace Butterfield, mm -hmm. and it takes place in in England, mm -hmm. at um, at uh, at Westminster Abbey. At yes. Westminster Abbey. Mm -hmm. Abbey. Now, um, I had always thought writers were supposed to write about what they know, and I know that you have been, uh, have done a number of things, but certainly you. Uh, Cape Codder, mm -hmm. uh, not a Londoner. No. So, um, what was your inspiration for writing about the Triforium at uh, at the Abbey? I was at the Abbey in 1985 and spent about three hours there. I had won a, a trip. Uh, the previous year, I had been to Great Britain and had gotten an open to view ticket, which allowed me to go to all the historic sites for one price. Mm -hmm. After I had returned and spending around Christmas in Falmouth about this time, uh, I had s s filled out, uh, a, 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 there was a, a puzzle on it devised by the uh, editor for the uh, London Times crossword puzzle section and it involved a series of cryptograms and anagrams. And I, there were six of them, and I figured them out. One was like, uh, uh, so easy, even Babe could solve it, which was Melrose Abbey, which was one of the sites that you could go on the open the view ticket. And around Christmas, I got a response that I had won the trip. So I went to Great Britain, uh, to London, specifically to uh, Christie's, where they had a ceremony where they gave me a a crystal eagle, and then I had a couple days in London. I had two weeks where they were going to pay for almost where I could go anywhere in Great Britain. But I went to Westminster Abbey, and it struck me, independent of the Triforium, that it was <coughs> England's historic attic, and it was a little bit of everything there. All their great monarchs and writers and scientists and some 3,000 people stuffed into this little space, and that sort of inspired it. I can, I can understand that. Certainly you've picked a setting, a rich, rich history. I, I think you're, I, I enjoyed very much the opening chapter because it seemed to me it evokes the sense that uh, a place really is built upon many, many layers. And in your book, uh, the, the Celts, the Romans, the Anglo-Saxons, and some of the mythology that 
that it goes along with those. All of that is, uh, is in your book. You um, certainly have some pretty eminent ghosts. I do. Uh, yes, I have Charles Darwin and Jack Catch the Headsman. I have Sir Isaac Newton, uh, uh, Charles Henry Fielding, who was a uh, detective that Charles Dickens, whose ghost is also in the book, used to chum around with and go to murder scenes. Uh -huh. uh, there are lots of ghosts right, in it, yes. Right. And those ghosts are, there's uh, a bit of mayhem mm. you know, that goes on. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, um, the, the Abbey is um, actually, there have been some rumors that uh, mm -hmm. a couple of ghosts uh, inhabit the place. Right. Charles, Charles, or I'm sorry, John Bradshaw, who uh, at the end of the British Civil War, when Cromwell had, um, had taken over and King Charles II had been dethroned and decapitated, was uh, the presiding judge at the trial of the king. He showed up three days late and didn't want to hear the evidence that went before. Uh, said that he had heard enough and uh, ordered the king to be executed. He then had an office in the, the Triforium, and his ghost is supposedly still haunting the Triforium. His body was, when he died, interred in Westminster Habit with mm -hmm. the notables. Mm -hmm. But uh, when Charles I's son, Charles II, came into power, he actually had Cromwell and another person and Bradshaw removed and hanged oh, wow. <laughs> and wow. buried somewhere else. Right, so. yeah. That when we read this, it all seems that these hangings and these doings were done so casually that yeah. it's pretty, pretty scary. We don't want viewers to think that you've written a history. This is a novel mm -hmm. with suspense, and you have a modern character, Wallace Butterfield, who, can you tell viewers the plot without giving too much away? Uh, he lacks self-confidence. His father was an architect. He is an architect. And he has been summoned by the Reverend the Pota Purudi, to, who's in charge of the Westminster Abbey Fund, to present a plan for a tower because the Westminster Abbey Fund feels that Westminster Abbey should have a significant tower. Um, most of the other churches in England have towers or spires, and they wanted something similar to that. Um, he's, of course, invited there under false pretenses. Uh, and um, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that, th though this is the mechanism to get him there, uh, while I was writing the book, um, I knew that they were thinking of putting a glass elevator up to the Triforium. Um, but then after I had finished it, and two days before it was published, I read in the London Telegraph that they were actually going to build a tower on the outside to the Triforium. And uh, during the process of uh, digging up a lavatory, uh, to build the tower. They found uh, 50 or more skeletons that dated from the time of the Norman Conquest. And skeletons are, as I said, there are some 3,000 and counting people wow. buried in that abbey, and recently they right. went through the high altar underneath it and found some more people they can't identify. So it's, it's quite a collection of potential ghosts. Right. How exciting for you to realize that this was happening after you had written the book. I mean, there's inspiration right there yeah, to, coincidental, uh, certainly. to have a look at it. What's good about the, the book, I think, and uh, it has not been released yet, uh, uh, it seems, uh, when viewers get a chance to read it, there's, uh, you have at the end of it uh, some of the documentation so people, if they're curious about, mm -hmm, about English history. history, can mm -hmm. read, uh, mm -hmm. read more about it. You've done a lot of research for this book. Mm -hmm. right? Now, it's interesting that, um, that you would um, write about, um, about the Triforium uh, since your own background has been quite different. But I understand you've also written other novels. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Or, no, not maybe novels, but um, nonfiction. 
Uh, no, uh, they're, they're, they're fiction. They certainly have a, a lot of rooting in the jobs I've done throughout oh, my see. life. Uh, I wrote one about um, a, uh, a drilling rig that I worked on. I work I, uh, about a family funeral that was yeah. very bizarre that involved relatives in West Virginia, um, a police procedural that was offbeat, and a sea story. I was a, a helmsman for Huey when I was 19. Oh, so. that's right. Were you born on Cape Cod? No, I, oh. I, I was born in the Midwest. I came here oh. at 15. I see. And you got a job with Huey mm -hmm. and um, went to Northeastern. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, studied criminal law. Criminal justice, yes. Oh, criminal justice. I was yes. a police officer in Falmouth for 12 years wow. and then director of natural resources, mm -hmm. which has a lot of law enforcement application for 21 years. Mm -hmm. But your hobby is uh, writing and literature. You're a, right. a reader and a writer. That's true. Right, right. right. And so um, it seems that, um, that your book um, may not be familiar to viewers because it's an e-book. Can you tell us wh what is involved with an e-book? That is to say, it's not a physical book. Right. It's, it's actually on Amazon right now and can be purchased for $5.99. Right. But, <laughs> It's, um, it, you download it to a uh, computerized device to read it. There's no, obviously no paper or anything involved in it. Um, it's a fairly simple process. You can, if you have a Kindle or a Kobo, it's, it's extremely simple. Mm -hmm. Amazon offers a free application that allows uh, anyone to uh, convert their laptop or their, their uh, PC uh, so that it will accommodate e-books, so you can read it on any kind of computer screen. Mm -hmm. So, and um, it's, a, it's uh, available now? Right, it is. It's through Amazon, and it's through the publishing firm Edge Scientific and Fantasy. Mm -hmm. they're, they're my publishers. This is a specialized publi publishing company, then. They uh, particularly uh, publish fantasy, not... Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. good, good. They're from Canada, and they're mm -hmm. the premier uh, science fiction for Canada. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important, we should make the distinction that this is not self-published, that your no. that publisher accepted your manuscript mm -hmm. and, uh, and has, uh, has published it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, to go back to the story mm -hmm. of the Triforium, the, um, the, of course it's, it's fiction, uh, uh, it seems to me that um, what you've done is to uh, um, move the story as uh, Wallace Butterfield becomes involved, several characters be in, begin to involve him, mm -hmm. who are themselves uh, paranormal. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. right. uh, there is an organization called Witch, and it's uh, women in therapeutic chemical healing. Uh, they have a different malady. Butterfield is in a situation where his ghost has come unstuck. And there's this blue apparition that can only be seen by a few people just towering over his head. Um, the witches have a different malady where it's scrambled within their brains. And so sometimes their ghosts take over them, possess them. And so they have this support group in order to deal with it. Some handle this through the occult, and others use absinthe. And uh, absinthe has a, um, uh, a uh, psychotropic property where it can cause hallucinations, and it was a favorite drink of many uh, people in literature and the arts, like yes, uh, yeah. uh, Kipling and Twain and Poe and Picasso and uh, Toulouse-Lautrec right, and right. Uh, Vincent van Gogh right. all partook it, uh, in it. I uh, think I, I got introduced to absinthe through Eric Maria Remarque. Uh, it okay. seems so, so glamorous. Yes. So um, it's, it, it's certainly not the thing you buy over the counter today isn't the old-fashioned absinthe, but uh, they, uh, some of these witches use absinthe as a way of controlling their inner demon, yeah. and they are also very interested in Wallace Butterfield. And so, and so the plot continues. I sort of sensed a little satire there, too, yeah. a little um, 
uh, maybe some satire of feminism. Uh, there's uh, there's yeah. satire of everything, yes. I hope. I know. You know, it's the kind of book where you, that really evokes lots of things. They, they say about reading that, that readers bring meaning to mm -hmm. the printed page, so mm -hmm. that whatever you think is happening, the, the book is rich and probably requires a lot of cooperation on the part of the reader, too, mm -hmm. to start imagining things. Uh, but there's a, a great deal of humor as well. Thank you. Yes. I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Now, um, you've written other things. Tell us something about the other, uh, other books. Very often, now that you have been published, maybe you should not um, discard the, um, your earlier writings. It would be nice if they could be yeah, published, yeah. certainly. Um, one is about a family funeral that took place in Florida, and it's, it's autobiographical. Mm -hmm. I um, had a grandfather who, in his late 80s, asked me to go to his mother's grave. And he was a big, burly, cantankerous man who never showed any sen sentimentality. And we went to this, uh, uh, this cemetery, and we looked forever for her grave, and finally found it. So I knew he had never been there yeah. since she had been buried. And he fell to his knees and started crying. And he told me this story that went to Hurricane West Virginia, a bordello, uh, a uh, illegitimate son whom he never wow. met. He was working in the coal mines. He fled. Uh, the son was raised by his grandparents. There was a murder involved, and the son eventually uh, became. He was in World War II, the Battle of Okinawa in the Navy, and he eventually became a test pilot. And <clears throat> my grandfather asked me to find him, and he was wow. born in 1927. And he didn't even know his name. He just knew the name of the woman mm -hmm. uh, he had wronged. And I found him and, reun and reunited them. And so it. Oh, it, yeah. And that's, it, that's, they say that everyone has a story, but indeed, this <laughs> is a story. Yeah. How could you not write that? Yeah, when I got back uh, from the funer right. his funeral, I started writing. Right, yeah. right. But you know, um, your interest in writing probably comes from your, the fact that you. Uh, you had said to me that you're quite a reader. Uh -huh. Right. Right. I've, I've got I probably have easily over a thousand books in my house, and there's always a book in my hand when I'm home. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, have you ever taken a creative writing course? Or? No, I haven't. No. Interesting. Yeah. And um, uh, you don't belong to a writer's group? Um, not really. Briefly, uh, back in the 80s at the market bookshop, the old market bookshop. Oh yes, lovely yeah. place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I suppose uh, the only way to write is to sit down and to do it. And, and do it. You're quite disciplined about writing. Yes. Uh, and did it take long to do? Uh, the Triforium is a long book. It, it um, took a year to write and six months to research and a lot of time to try to market it, yeah. find a publisher. Yes. And fortunately, Edge had put a lot of, they took me out of what they called the slush pile, which are mm -hmm. unsolicited manuscripts that they really don't want to look at. Right. But uh, fortunately, uh, one of the editors went through it and found my manuscript and put it up against a series of other manuscripts. And they had a committee, and they started to weed out a lot of them, and after three times through committee, mine survived. Mm -hmm. And uh, with about 20 other authors, they started their uh, e-books. And I don't mm -hmm. think they've ever gone into e-books this way before, and it's an experiment for them. So oh, I feel that's very exciting. fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Exciting for you to be part of this, yep. a new initiative. Mm -hmm. And so once again, so the viewers will know, they just go to Amazon, uh, type in the tri for him, mm -hmm. and the rest of the directions will be, will be, will be there. It's really easy. Right. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, what, what, what advice would you have for um, some viewers out there who are struggling and writing, and many of them thinking of self-publishing? Have you, uh, did you try, think, did you think at all about doing that? No, I, I seriously didn't, because it was my hope to be picked up someday by a publisher, and uh, this is the fourth try. 
And the nice thing about it is now I can say that I'm not an amateur writer anymore, or a wannabe writer. Yeah, and right. that in itself, even if I don't make any money, is, is, is reassuring. Uh, I think with me, with the writing process, is just to write and just keep writing. And one word follows the next, one sentence follows the next, one paragraph, right. page, chapter, and then you have a book. And it, it seems to, it's a little like a crossword puzzle. It's fitting it together. Yes. Right. right. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, you need to have uh, probably the, um, I've always thought that a writer start with a what if kind of question. Mm -hmm. And obviously, let's say that you may have said to yourself, ah, there's this, uh, this abbey, uh, triforium. Mm -hmm. What if mm -hmm. all those eminent people who are buried there came back as ghosts? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And was that part of your thought process? That was process? part of the yeah. process. What yeah. if they all came back and mm -hmm. then you simply take that? Then I had to figure out why. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Why? Yeah. why? Yeah. And what would they do? Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. And you get a little bit of it and then it gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What, um, uh, apart, and now you're a Falmouth resident now, you've retired here. Mm -hmm. What other things besides, uh, besides writing or is that your main hobby? I used to sail a lot for 30-some years, and I gave that up when I got some land in northern New Hampshire I built a log home on. And so my, my wife, Nikki, uh, who's a cellist, mm -hmm. uh, and I go up there and spend several months during the summer. But the cabin is, the uh, you know, it's got 66 acres of land and mountain uh -oh. views, and so we have a lot of fun up there. So yeah, being yes. outdoors is, well, I was in natural resources for that's 21 right. years, so that's just that's an extension. Right. That's right. Yeah. And so, but writing is uh, sedentary, so you, it's a nice balance then for you mm -hmm. to be able to, to spend um, how many hours a day do you try? Mm, about four hours, four yeah. Hours, yeah. Right. yeah. That, seems, uh, that seems quite enough. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so you have the balance of being able to be outdoors as well. Right. Right, right. So viewers, viewers um, of the Triforium will recognize your name and um, perhaps um, let's hope that some of your other stories. Do you have any ideas about what you'd like to do next? I'm thinking of getting into a, a, a dream state uh, and having the character somehow end up in uh, South America in around the fifth century. And I've, I've got a few ideas for that, okay. and I'll try yeah. to work that out. Right. History and some research, probably, Yes, yes, too. and the two will be... Right. And as a matter of fact, while thinking about other books, there's something uh, open-ended about the ending of the mm -hmm. Triforium. Uh, it's you know, one questions, what does all this mean mm -hmm. for, the, for the character? Yeah. So maybe... It yeah. could. Yeah. It could become yeah. a, a second or a third book. Right. 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 I would have fun if it did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could just pick that up and continue yeah. continue doing yeah. that. Doing that. So um, viewers then can check uh, The Triforium by Mark Patton. And um, it's been a delight having you here and talking about your book. And I certainly wish you um, well. I hope that you will have lots of readers and continue to do the writing that you love. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah. Delighted to be yeah. here. Thanks for watching, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time on Conversations.